Welcome to Perspectives, a podcast from Zeit Contemporary Art, exploring art and its ideas. I'm your host, Samuel Shapiro. Photography has always been a uniquely mobile medium, unconfined to an artist's studio. In the 1840s, William Henry Fox Talbot took pictures in Paris and London and Oxford for the pencil of nature. Gustave Le Gray captured churches along the pilgrimage route to Santiago de Compostela in the 1850s. Alexander Gardner followed in the footsteps of the American Civil War, photographing corpse-strewn battlefields in the 1860s. And Timothy O'Sullivan surveyed the American West into the 1870s. So what happens to the medium when its peripatetic practitioners are locked in place? When they lose access to the world's photographic face, what happens to photography under lockdown? Today, I'm speaking with two talented young photographers about photography and interiority about the necessarily inward turn their photography has taken during our collective confinement. Bryson Rand earned an MFA from the Yale School of Art in 2015, and in 2019 attended the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture. He's shown in galleries from Berlin to Mexico City to New York, where he's had solo exhibitions at Zeit Contemporary Art and La Mama Galleria, and where he participated in an exhibition at the Leslie Lohman Museum of Gay and Lesbian Art. He's published four books, been featured in multiple magazines, and has lectured at Harvard University, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and the School of Visual Arts. Ress received an MFA from the Yale School of Art in 2017, and has shown throughout the United States and Europe. Their work has been featured in Aperture, the Paris Review, Cultured, and W Magazine. In 2017, Ress won the Baxter Street Camera Club's New York Annual Juried Competition, and in 2018, their book, Towers of Thanks, which explores their mother's role as the construction manager for Trump Tower, was a finalist for the Lucy Photo Book Prize. I asked Ress and Bryson about their practices, the impacts of lockdown they've experienced artistically and personally, and the state of photography today. This episode is presented in conjunction with Zeit Contemporary Art's viewing room, The World Within, Photography and Interiority, which runs online through December 31st. And now, it's my pleasure to share with you Rez and Bryson Rand's perspectives. Thank you both for coming on the show. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. So I'm a dedicated listener of multiple art podcasts, perhaps unsurprisingly, but the minor absurdity of discussing a predominantly visual medium through a purely auditory format isn't lost on me. I'd encourage everyone listening to check out Zeit's viewing room to see excellent examples of your recent work. But for those who might not have done so, can I ask you both, perhaps you can start, Bryson, to say a bit about your process and to describe one of the photographs in the show. Okay, um, well, for the, the works that are on view in the, the viewing room have all been made in the past uh, six or seven months since being in various forms of quarantine and lockdown. Um, they're of uh, my husband, Ryan, and our friend, Patrick McNabb, who's a photographer as well, who's like part of our quarantine pod. Um, And they really just kind of came about uh, through necessity, you know, being someone who photographs people uh, in studio, out in the world, in various, you know, situations. I was completely cut off from that. Um, And my husband, Ryan, became my sort of willing model. (laughs) Uh, He typically is not super enthusiastic about being photographed, but um, I think he took a little bit of pity on me. Uh, and I think maybe the the first picture that I f- I remember making of him that I was excited about is the one titled Ryan Eclipse. Uh, he's he was usually how they come about. I would sort of see him walking through some sort of like dramatic light in our apartment, which we get a lot of because we have a bunch of windows. Um, and he had just shaved his head bald. It was like his first quarantine <laughs> haircut. Um, and there was just this really uh, beautiful line of light and shadow falling across his face coming uh, from the window in my like studio in the apartment where I'm recording right now. Um, so he's like kind of in, in three quarter profile looking towards the light. Um, you know, he's got this big round bald head. And when I showed him the photo, he goes, oh, I look like an eclipse, <laughs> which I thought was really sweet. And it also kind of signified the beginning of him like taking more of an interest in, in being part of the, the work, uh, which is exciting for me. Um, not that he was ever like, I hate your photography. He just didn't love being 
photographed, you know, kind of spontaneously. Um, but he's come around. So there's also a social development along with the formal development in these works. Exactly. <laughs> Rez, how about you? Um, yeah, similarly to Bryce and this, all this work is pretty new. Um, I started it mostly. So right before quarantine kind of began, I moved to Sweden. So I kind of moved over here with like two suitcases worth of stuff. So I got here and then pretty quickly afterwards, I went into quarantine um, following the American protocol and really was wanting to make work. But more than that, I was really trying to locate myself here and also locate myself within just the experience of being out of a kind of location and establishing a type of home. And so I started by photographing just objects I found around this apartment. Um, and it was kind of more because I, it wasn't so much my things or my place or my home. I was beginning to kind of take that process of making an image and space it out throughout a day where there would be a type of familiarity. If I saw something and I observed it, I'd kind of come back to it and spend the whole day kind of photographing it and then editing it and leaving it there. So in that kind of process, it created this almost like kind of conversation or familiarity with an object in the process of making it, returning back to it, seeing how the light changes, trying different things as if I was working in a studio, which I have done in some, for some images before, but I hadn't really until this time had the um, space truly and the um, kind of parameters that made me really slow down and make what I think of as I don't want to say simpler, but that's the word that comes to mind right in this moment. Um, because I know that's kind of a, a, a loaded term, but I felt more free to just in the parameters, just make work with what was around me and kind of see where I could go with just you know, the flowers I bought the other day at the market or um, cutting into a pomegranate or um, doing some spring cleaning around the house. And that really opened up a lot for me in, in a very, in a space that felt overwhelmingly um, the opposite. So to hone in on a few formal characteristics of each of your work, uh, Bryson, you, you seem to typically shoot in black and white, and you're particularly attentive to the play of light and shadow, as you were just describing. In these works in particular, shadows often appear as linear grids on top of your subjects. So why black and white, first of all, and what are we to make of these gridded shadows? Um, so I, I learned photography uh, back in the 90s as a teenager uh, in the studio in a dark room so my first experience with photography was working in black and white um, when I finished college I got a digital camera and I shot in color for a while but it was really just because the camera captured color it wasn't really a conscious decision and fa fast forward a few years and I was applying to grad school at Yale um, and my friend Curran was looking at my portfolio of color pictures that I was applying with and he was like you know your your pictures are in color but the color is not really doing anything and I was like oh ow but it, it, I also like thought about that and was like you know he was right <clears throat> so I decided to kind of dip back into black and white and just see what happened and I found really quickly that I was able to see better and like construct an image in a way that felt more solid to me than in color was like the color was almost a distraction um and then as i continued on in grad school i was thinking a lot about kind of uh being in touch with specific histories you know as a as a gay man there's a a, a lot of history of loss um 
that came before me that was like occurring while I was growing up. And I thought black and white sort of situated the work in this almost in-between space. It wasn't, it didn't look like pictures from, you know, the, the 50s, 60s, 70s, but it also didn't look specifically like 2015, you know, or whenever I was making the work. Um, and in terms of the, the play of light and shadows, um, again, that kind of came about just through making work in my apartment, which is not something I typically do. Um, you know, and realizing like these dramatic beams of light that were falling on Ryan's body or just being cast around the apartment. Um, and I real, you know, I, my pictures are always about like generosity and care for the people that I'm photographing. But, you know, in our current um, state of affairs, there was this sort of closing in feeling or feeling like we were stuck inside, you know, and I thought the light kind of mimicked that, you know, the, I'm thinking of the picture of Ryan standing behind the chair with that beam of light just going straight down his body. That illumination feels really beautiful and like a caress. Um, but the way the shadows are like closing in on him on all the other sides kind of, I think, replicate the feeling of being kind of trapped by our circumstances. Um, and that's just something I, you know, wanted to play with. Similar to the picture of Pat with the like diagonal lines going across his face. Um, you know, that's from an actual like set of bars that are on our windows, like to prevent people from coming in. Uh, so I, I thought that was an interesting kind of dynamic between the light and shadow during this time. Uh, Rest. the images you've chosen for the show are a wonderful contrast with Bryson's. Um, he's working with humans, you're working with objects. He's in black and white, you're working almost always in color. Uh, can you say a bit more about your decision to turn to still life and what role you see color playing in the still lives? Sure, yeah. Um, I would say, in general, I've worked mostly, I haven't worked with black and white since photo one. Um, and although some of the images of this project are in black and white, the choice for the choice of using color is kind of specific to each individual image. And I say that only because I gave myself the um, option to photograph in either, um, which also felt like um, just another way of really considering the object and the time spent with it. Um, I chose to photograph objects uh, because I couldn't really photograph anything else. Um, I decided that there was something to really be found in just looking at what was right there in front of me in the apartment. And that just happened to be a bunch of different objects. One of the things I was really interested in in this work was surface and touch and creating that um, sense. And I think working with color can really activate different um, subjectivities and spaces within yourself. It might want to pull you closer to an image, pull you further away. And I think because I was working with objects and it was just me in the room with these objects, like for instance, in the image self-portrait warm, I wasn't wearing my clothing while I took that photograph. So what I was able to do is kind of look at something as an extension of myself, but kind of look at the way the light falls on the, like what would presumably be my chest and think about that as a form of touch, right? In the absence of a lot of sensations, you fall back on the form. So these different bits of kind of what you do when you're editing or these shifts in perspective or these shifts in light and using different types of light all related back to um, a desire and a longing for touch. Um, and I, I think that that's actually something that's a part of my practice at large. I mean, with every, I'm a project based photographer. So the way that I enter into making the images for each project formally are different based on 
the experiences of being in various different spaces and what I'm kind of trying to communicate and that shifts throughout actually each project, um, giving myself different modes and languages to express as much as I feel I need to, um, or that is appropriate for what I'm trying to communicate. And since in this case, there was no overarching kind of narrative, I did have this freedom, freedom to really just focus on these kind of simple, or I keep using the word simple, maybe I'll just stick with it. But these kind of pleasures of the of surface and of the simple seduction of color or the um, kind of anxiety of perspective shifts or the actual closeness. A lot of the images are very, you're very close to them and that's actually pretty consistent through the series. So I think maybe, I think of, of all the through line, it's just this kind of longing and desire to get close, but then also the creation of a type of presence to just kind of be with the object and in the space and communicate what it just felt like that particular day to be looking at this particular thing and have that be um, celebrated in a way with its odds and ends and imperfections and anxieties and just kind of, like I said, celebrations. Yeah, on, on the note of closeness and of expressing what it felt like that day, I'd like to ask you both about the relationship between photography and interiority. On the one hand, unlike drawing or painting, the photographic image doesn't come from the hand per se. It doesn't quite emanate from within. It instead captures what's without. On the other hand, there is something deeply personal about both of your photographs, um, whether it be the relationship to Ryan's gaze in your work, Bryson, or even uh, the wrinkles in the shirt in the photograph you were just talking about, Rez. This isn't documentary photographs. Um, so can I ask you to talk about how you use the externally oriented apparatus of the camera to compose internal expressions like you were just talking about? Well, that, that's something I've thought about a lot in my work, you know, specifically the use of light and shadow as a way to alter a space and make it transform into something that feels more emotionally uh, or psychologically resonant, you know? I mean, if you look around, this is the a room that I photographed in, have been photographing in, you know, during this period of lockdown. And the way it looks now is like just your pretty standard room. But I think part of the magic of photography is that you can alter that sensation. You can completely transform a space just through the simple use of what the light and what the shadows are doing. Um, and that's something I've been interested in, you know, for years in, in terms of my work. Um, and I think, you know, I, I don't want to put words in Rez's mouth, but I, I think I find a commonality in our work and sort of this idea of making a record almost, or like this undeniability of our experience through photography. You know, there's an, an immediacy to it um, that I think you know, heightens all those, those sensations. Yeah, I would say that um, the majority of my work looks nothing like the, what it actually looks like when you're in the room with it. And I, I, I personally spend a lot of time, um, not in an obvious overt way, um, working with images in post and returning to them and lighting them very specifically. So I actually wouldn't say that there's, it, it's not the complete, like for instance, like in that self portrait that I was speaking to earlier, it's a couple of different light sources and the way the flash hits the edges of the shirt, you can see movement in it. So you see this type of blurring and then you see the natural light hitting the texture of the shirt and the way that different shadows create different re like different perspectival planes or shifting to black and white, which then flattens the whole image that kind of, and it, it, it's a completely different way of thinking about depth or thinking about um, difference in terms of light and color, right? If that particular image of um, Judy's 
Sapa through a seltzer glass, for instance, was in black, it was in color, it, you wouldn't be able to take it all in um, optically. There would be no way to, to do it because it's three different light sources. And then, I mean, actually the picture actually wouldn't even exist on its own because it's a bunch of, a whole bunch of different pictures combined. Um, and so the, I think for a lot of us, we're doing all of these different things that are not really perceivable once you have the final image. And the process of that for many of us is hugely significant. And if we think about interior and subjectivity, I, and especially as in the case for Bryson and I think about queerness, which of course touches us differently, the whole process of getting to what you see on the surface and the whole reality of dealing with what is interpreted on a surface versus the kind of process that goes into it or the reality behind it. Um, and, and what goes into the making of a photograph, I think is pretty si significant for me, I can say, as a queer person whose queerness is not necessarily as legible in the subject matter. I definitely think of the way that it enters into the process of making. And even so, as Bryson's talking about care and generosity and the way that you create these images, and, and I, I think about that too in the work that I do, it's, it's, there are always remnants of it in the image. And there are always kind of remnant, there's little bits of all these kinds of processes and things. And one of the reasons why I loved working with objects or kind of working with these little bits of light or these little bits of um, kind of whatever is around you, there's, it, 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 it acknowledges all of this other stuff that goes on around it. Um, and it is, you know, we're talking about Bryson's work and the light and the feeling of confinement. It, it's not depicting, right? It's the interior, but it's the implication of the outside world. And in the case of my work, it's the implication of the inside world. It's not literally in front of you, but there's, it's, it's um, again, pulled to the surface, right? We work with surfaces with photography, but you can feel it, you have a sense for it. And I do think that that's happening in the creation, I wouldn't separate it so much from the act of making a painting necessarily for, for me um, or making a sculpture. When you're thinking about flash and the way that you're bringing texture, you're creating those shadows, you're creating that depth. I just think sometimes creating this separation between painting and photography and sculpture can, maybe not for the other mediums, but for ours, will kind of reduce the type of work that goes into it because it's a completely different process and one that I don't know how helpful it is to kind of separate it because there's so much within what we're doing. Do you, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I, it's funny you say that because like photography is kind of always like the bastard child of the other arts, which I think a lot of photographers sort of self impose at, the, at this point. But, you know, in thinking of what you were just saying, like, um, I can see in your work, like the physicality of you moving and like engaging with the, the objects or the, even, you know, when you're photographing people. Um, and I have a similar way of working. Like I never just like plant my camera and stand in one spot. Like I'm moving around and moving the flash and moving my body and coming closer and moving away. You know, I think there is like, um, an obvious physicality that comes through. I'm thinking, I don't know if this picture ended up in the, the viewing room but the picture you had of the phone like on mm -hmm. like a dock and like you're showing a horizon on the phone but then you're kind of photographing it from this strange angle and like pictures like that really give me the sensation of your body moving around to make the image and how you're interacting with whatever it is you're photographing um and i've i found that really exciting in seeing this new work of yours uh, and it also made me think of, you know, you're, you were talking about kind of searching for familiarity in this, you know, doubly unfamiliar situation when you move to a new country and then have to go into lockdown. I can imagine the, the, the feeling of just sort of like being off balance or like falling into or away from things. And I really got that sensation looking through the work that you selected. Yeah, thank you. And I think that part of it also beyond all that and that image, the horizon, it's also the kind of the alienation of the screen space, the idea that the, we always talk about the horizon as a fixed thing, right? you know, but really it's just a fucking mess like everything else. 
Um, and so you have the, the, the way that we're looking at this, the screen and the textures and the, the colors of the screen, which are kind of hard to take in, and then the shadow and the shifts in the perspectives, which um, it's, it's a still life by definition, right. but it, it's, not, it's not still. So how do you kind of, and I, I think for so many of us, like we're dealing with two dimensional surface and you're dealing with trying to articulate beyond it, knowing all the limits of the form. And sometimes, you know, you want to make people actually feel uneasy physically, or as if they're sliding off the edge of the surface, or there's something perplexing about it. And I think that that happens in your work too, Bryson, with a lot of, um, it, it's not, the activation for me isn't just in the shadow and the light, which is certainly there, but it's also, I can too feel you moving, but it takes on a, a kind of significance in that you feel of the environment. Mm. So the lens isn't so far away. There are things that are kind of interrupting the frame. It feels, and, and I think this is another interesting aspect of like the objective photographer or the distant photographer, or how do we formally introduce subjectivity, which you know can be the elbow creeping in or the edge of a door or different ways that let you know that there it isn't just the lens and then the world, you know, there's, there's something happening between these planes. And I think shifting like the surface that's de depictable in, a, in an image can let the viewer and actually for me um, is a formal way of talking about my relationship to the object. Right. So it's not just in the choice of subject matter right, if we talk about the tenderness, you were talking about the light falling on Ryan or, you know, the decision for, for me to kind of flatten something into black and white, or these are all ways of kind of introducing our subjectivity as well as, um, for me, a, a way of, a way of trans, not, it's not just translating, it's, it's the act of making the image where the meaning comes out. It's not so much what you're looking at, so I wouldn't say that it, it's as simple to separate photography and painting as if we just go in there with this tool and we just snap something, right? <laughs> wouldn't it be nice if it was that easy? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, we have that. That's why I'm a terrible iPhone photographer. <laughs> Those are very fair rejoinders to my unfair caricature of, paint, of photography <laughs> as a purely mechanical um, operation. I, I want to come back to something you both touched on about the introduction of subjectivity. Bryson, you were talking about making a record experience. Um, Rez, you were talking about the interaction between what's behind the surface and what's on the surface. Um, and so can I ask you guys to just speak more directly to the relationship between the construction of a photograph and the construction of identity and how queerness operates both as a thematic and as a perspective um, within your practices? You know, I've been really focused on making portraits for the last like two years and sort of what the potential, where the potential lies in making portraits and what it even means to make a portrait rather than photographs with people in it, you know? Like what is the, what is the action that's occurring? And also what is the interaction between myself and the person that I'm photographing? Um, and thinking about, you know, this idea of a portrait being um, a representation of the subject's essence or like who they are as a person, which I think is maybe an impossible task. Uh, and a little glimmer of that can come through, but I think more of what is occurring, what I've been focusing on is, is how to depict sort of the engagement or the interaction between me and the other person. Um, so in that way, I'm sort of projecting myself onto them or onto the situation that's unfolding. Um, and so I think in terms of like, so much of my identity as a queer person comes from like understanding the history of other queer people um, and the like the current, you know, existence of other queer people that are outside of my own experience. Um, and so I don't even really know how to say this, but I think in in sort of um, establishing my identity, it has been so much through these other interactions. Um, and maybe that is part of what 
I'm trying to depict. Totally. Yeah, I'd say um, with addressing subjectivity, there's so much of yourself that you bring into a work. A subjective experience is also not always legible mm -hmm. to yourself and to others. And I think for myself, um, where my queerness comes in as, as someone who has studied and really ad kind of always admired different um, expressions of queerness through photography and a s slew of other mediums. Um, it's, it's very varied and it, and it should be. And um, I, for me personally, like I actually rarely get asked about my queerness as it relates to my work. And I, in a lot of ways can understand why, um, because I think we focus a lot on subject as it relates to a discussion of our subjectivity. In this work, I've made some choices where you can see there's a type of humor. Growing up queer, for instance, a long glare from someone, and this is without knowing anything about cruising, was like the world to me the world, the outside chance that someone else was communicating, this was before the internet, was communicating something to me, was huge. So what is queerness and what is subjectivity? Like the desire to look at something for a very long time, for me in this, what seemed as kind of, what could be conceived as a type of secretive moment was a huge, huge world to me. So just kind of creating a long stare or, there being this kind of unanswerable question or, um, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm now trying to relate that back to form and trying to think about the images that were selected and how I could really give you a specific example of it. <laughs> but um, I think another aspect to what I was working with is that I photographed a ton of flowers and I continue to photograph a ton of flowers. Almost in every series I've made, there have been flowers in, in these objects. And I could relate that to my personal queer subjectivity. I was kind of picked out at the age of five um, or even actually younger to be the flower girl in all of these Greek weddings. I grew up in a huge Greek um, family surrounded by a bunch of um, young boy cousins. So I was thrown into this role of being this flower girl. Um, and I, I had nothing against the flowers, but I had a lot against the role because of all the dresses. And I loved sitting there and watching all my cousins put their makeup on. And I loved kind of the whole experience of admiring other people's relationships with the makeup, the flowers, all these things. They just weren't mine. So when you're trying to search for your own relationship, you're engaging a history. I know that actually in a, in a fair amount of the work, there are these references to this type of, I'm working with flowers. I have, there's, you know, there's a reference to the dinner party. There's reference to, I have an image of a, of a, a dick. There's, there's all, there's all these loaded images, but, and I, I'm not working with them kind of cluelessly, but I also, get to work with them in a way that is a little bit less didactic, mm. which I think actually opens for um, the option for appreciating different subjectivities if you can create something of, something of a space to slow it down. Or in that, and that's why I focus on the texture and the color and different aspects so that, you know, you could be looking at a flower and some of the images I've made of flowers are beautiful images of flowers and I have nothing against that but they're loaded too you know and I I it's wonderful to have the freedom in some ways in different projects as I said there's no overarching narrative here I don't have to explain every aspect of the work and I think that's another way that the subjective the subjective can enter into it um, because it doesn't, it doesn't, it can be, it can exist without, outside of knowing, if that's possible. It can exist outside of um, serving an absolute function, which I actually think, I mean, as we know, is queer, right? We think about reproduction. We think about um, just kind of 
seeking desire, seeking pleasure, seeking taste, seeking um, touch, all of these different things outside of, you know, these kind of normative responsible roles, like every medium, every institution, everything we touch has its relationship to tradition. Um, and there are different ways that we can break, break from that or work with that or sense our way around it. Um, but it's all, it's, it's all there to be kind of seen or discussed and talked about in my work particular. I kind of do enjoy, I guess, relating back to that question of queerness and subjectivity and my specific relationship to it as I was developing was the real desire to look for it and look for it specifically for me. Um, and, you know, as a queer non-binary person who is kind of searching for their own meaning around these things in, their, in, in the world, um, really making a space and allowing myself to kind of explore these things without, um, or not without, you can't escape any of these, any of anything, <laughs> but you can <laughs> give yourself the permission to make new meaning and meaning for yourself and share that meaning with the hope that other people will connect to it. Right. You know, it's the interesting what you were saying, Russ, about flowers in your work. And I, I think I have a similar relationship to water in my work. Like, mm. it took me a long time to realize that so much of my work involves water in some form or another and thinking back you know like you were thinking of as being a flower girl as a young child and i was on the swim team uh, mm -hmm. you know starting elementary school and like the water to me was like the place that i could escape and sort of like be in this silence and like be in my head and not worry about you know am i fitting in is this like obvious you know as like a kid who was struggling with their identity and their different, you know, quote unquote difference. Um, and so, yeah, like thinking about the potential of water as a symbol uh, in so many ways, but how it kind of relates back to such a personal experience for me um, has been like, it's been an exciting thing to embrace. And it's like, not when I'm, when I'm photographing a waterfall or a landscape, I'm not specifically thinking about being queer, but I think the way it ends up functioning in that body of work at like, takes ideas of uh, landscape photography and like switches them around a little bit. Um, and some, you know, that's an exciting uh, exploration to, to be a part of. Um, yeah. And like, I, when I think of flowers in your work, I immediately go to the pictures you made at Pulse, um, all the memorial flowers. And like, that is like so specifically related to our experience in the world as queer people and then how the flowers are functioning in, in your newer work where they become these meditative, like sensual moments that kind of are expansive beyond, you know, just an idea of queerness or just is maybe. No, absolutely. And I think, you know, the way that you're talking about working in black and white and working with bodies and how the history cannot be <laughs> separate from what we're seeing I relate to that with, you know, when I, when I work with different people throughout my life or when I work with flowers, right? They are, you carry all of this with you as you move through. So a set of terms that's come up in both of your recent answers have been intimacy and sensuality and eroticism. Um, and I wonder if either of you could speak to photography's unique relationship to the erotic? I, you know, go back and forth between wanting to make work that is like explicitly about desire and intimacy and sexuality and like intercourse um, and then finding other ways to explore and express sensuality that don't rely on erotics, you know, like in the landscape or uh, just in sort of the, even when I'm photographing other people, there's an, there is a celebration of like the texture of the skin, the hair that doesn't always have to rely on 
erotics, you know, or like a desire for sex. Um, yeah, I, th I think the medium just uh, like lends itself to to those explorations, you know. Yeah, I'm not gonna, I can't tackle the medium as it relates to erotics and cause it's just way too big. Not only is it <laughs> something that <laughs> informs erotic gaze, erotic consciousness, the construction of what we are supposed to desire, how we're supposed to desire it, um, where we're supposed to desire it, when we're supposed to desire it. I mean, it has a whole, whole obviously very complex history of um, really reducing a lot and there, I, I, we're both conscious of the dangers of all of it so I'm going to just move the history of the medium aside and then think about different erotics as it relates to our work perhaps not yeah. saying that it's not in conversation with all of these things but or, or with the history acknowledging all of that um, but I, I think what's interesting about when you give the option of an, an image as it relates to an experience is that people bring their own subjectivities into the interpretation mm -hmm. of what it is. Right. So there can be this really beautiful connection between, you know, what's occurring, the way that, you know, a photographer kind of interprets that and experiences it and translates it, and then the way that it's seen. And I think we talk about that so often in a way that's um, necessarily uh, critical and protective and thoughtful um again very necessarily so i think there's also all of these opportunities to really connect and share an erotic power and share desire and share and and locate different senses of eroticism in ourselves you know right. at the when it's limited to two-dimensional space no you can't hear can't taste you can't smell you have the ability to kind of um imagine these things and I think truly when you do look at something long enough you that can be pulled to the surface in you and that can change on the different day something else is pulled to the surface of, of um, what you're experiencing and I think all of that is is very uh, erotic and I do think the erotics can be found yes in color in the texture through a choice of using flash or using a natural light or and and this is beyond the subject right the, the choice of subject Right. So I think that there are so many different ways that we can pull on erotics, which is really sensuality. Yeah. And, and, and I do also think there's power in removing it from objects or removing it from the kind of well-worn path of the objects we think of as delivering us, delivering us to some sort of desire related space. So it's, um, I think there's a real power in um using a different type of vocabulary, different type of perspective and creating different forms and spaces to access pleasure. Right. And, and, and access it outside of at times the, even the subject, if we can do that. Yeah. Well, to pivot away from both of your own practices, um, I have a few questions just about the status of photography today. In many ways, everyone has become a photographer of their partner, of their domestic still lives, of their interiors right now. I'm not on social media, but I gathered that for a while people's feeds were dominated by at-home photography. Um, so how, how do you describe the position of your work in relationship to mass iPhone photography? What work does your work do differently? Um, you know, this is a conversation that comes up a lot. Uh, I actually was just giving a, a lecture to, a, or like an artist talk the other day to a class. And somebody asked that, you know, like, what's the difference between the type of work that I make and like, you know, Instagram photography. And um, when I was in grad school, I was in a class with John Pilson talking about this. And, you know, he brought up the fact that these kind of arguments about the saturation of photography in our world um, have been going on, you know, since like the twenties and like Walker Evans time. Uh, so it's not, it's nothing really new. I think it continues to shift and evolve, but he put it really simply, you know, the idea that, you know, photography is like an art form 
can't separate itself from like the rest of photography, all the other images we are saturated with. He boiled it down to the use of language, you know, like we're having a conversation right now and in your day-to-day -day conversation, words are used in a very sort of simple way. You know, they're debased in a, in a sense, like, cause they're not always meant to, to, to be beautiful or transformative. It's just a form of communication, but that type of language and poetry or prose and literature exist in a different way, right? They're using those same elements to, to elevate and to transform or to bring the reader or the viewer into an, in a different place. And I think the intention behind my work is how I make that separation. You know, I, sometimes my work ends up on my Instagram feed, but for the most part, the intention when I'm making a picture with my phone for Instagram say is very different than the engagement and the intention I have when I'm making work, you know, for the purposes of art. A lot of what you're saying, Bryson, resonates with me. Um, photography is such a vast medium and it's happening. Like I, I have a feeling because a photograph was made of it. There's just all these different things going on photographically that I, I couldn't even, I couldn't really begin to, to speak to any of it, uh, all of it. I, I know that the, a lot of the work that I've made is in dialogue with the function of photography. And I, I photograph screens a lot. I've used projects that engage archival material. I think about the evolution of photography and the way that it is used to create meaning and we kind of connect to these various different objects. I'd say for myself personally, you know, you kind of make peace with the fact that someone may just, it, you think about a, a, an image on a wall, someone could literally just not even look at it or walk right past it. And I've made peace with that. And especially on the internet, just literally just zoom right past it who cares that's not who I'm making work for and it's just kind of a reality you accept just as a human you could walk down the street and someone doesn't look you know it it's it it's not something that I I try to let take up a lot of a lot of space and my my concerns about how I need to make images or my fears about whether or not it's going to be seen or understood or that it's in a, gr a greater competition with now the millions and millions of images that we have just around us in a, one, a given week we're yeah. looking at thousands and thousands of images a day and of course that's going to change the way that we think about making images I but for myself I can't I can't necessarily say that oh I've I've tried to make images that are xyz more xyz because of its relationship to um our current image image reality um I I don't know if I can say that because I've always actually really appreciated slowing being able to slow things down or kind of focus on these like what we we're talking about these more uh textural kind of desires that maybe you can't get at on a phone David Wojnarowicz writes about creating something, making something that's like private and putting it into a public setting has like political ramifications and it can bring people together who have like a similar frame of reference and make them feel essentially less alone in the world. Or yeah. they can relate to something and they feel perhaps more empowered. And I have experienced that with other people's artwork and I have to believe that there are people out there who experience that when they interact with my work absolutely okay. yeah i guess you know i don't i i don't want to kind of perform as an anti-intellectual or academic artist but <laughs> i i don't get what what matters most to me is kind of using a language that i love and i appreciate and i value and figuring out a way to express myself through it, not limiting myself by it necessarily, although we always limit ourselves as humans, can't help it. But it's, it's, it's a language, we, we need it. And the ways that we need it ch changes. As we, it changes, we go back to certain things, we need it differently in a different day, we use yeah. it differently in a different day, we rely on it. For all of these tons of, and that's what matters to me. It's not so much, and now here we are talking about interior, interiority, but the relationship to it, I I think, and not not to sound really basic, it's it really is an interior kind of. What it means to me is what it means to me, and that 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 matters most. You know, I think for a lot of us, we establish these relationships with our practices, 
and with our work and with other artists that have meant a lot to us and that the real beauty has been in those those kind of one-on-one -on -one connections with this work and with our own practices and then you know sharing it with the world is a whole other endeavor and one that you can't really get too wrapped up in I, I mean for me I, I certainly can't because one you never know if anyone's going to want to look at it two you're not you don't necessarily agree with how that what they see and then you know there are all these this whole slew of other things that of course are important not something to not take seriously or think about because forget all the other realities of kind of working in a market and having to survive and try to figure out how to even function as an artist in this day and age but I think that the relationship I care most about is is Bryson's relationship with the medium what he's he's using it for what he's communicating um what he he he, he needs to see and what he wants to share and I think about that with myself too and you know so many of us make all this work that we never even show you know there's there are all these different ways to relate to the the, the desire to see something and to not just see it as it is in front of you have some sort of ability to um not not just make it your own but you actually get to see that what happens when your right let's interiority meets the external and that i do think happens on the in the image and that can reveal a lot not only to people who have the who are looking at the image but also to the person who's making the work right right yeah and i think there's actually an excitement in sort of letting go of wanting to control how people interpret the work and i like one of the things i love is in studio visits or you know, having conversations with people about my work or presenting my work and the things that people notice and the way they react to the work that is like totally outside of, of what I was thinking or what I would have, you know, thought was like the, the most impactful part of like a particular photograph. I actually find that to be really exciting, you know. Absolutely. And also the discourse around it. I think that it, art is, is, is generative yeah. and it, creates you know it creates a whole world around it yeah two final questions you both have been very responsible in speaking to the specifics of your own practices um, but i wonder if i can push you to make some irresponsible broad generalization generalizations <laughs> about the medium um and about i don't know if you can <laughs> Well, I just how do you think about the state of photography today and in what directions do you think the medium is heading? You know, what matters most to me in terms of the medium is that everyone's work is seen. So that it what matters most is actually create the kind of creating of opportunities and space for people who are not white, who are not, who are not cis, who are not um, using a really like fancy camera, who are, you know, the, just the level of access is what matters most, I think, in this day and age. And, you know, the conversations as it relates to the inst these institutions, these traditions, all of this needs to change. What I what I'm trying to say is that photography needs to change, and the the it, it's it's there. What needs to change is just the access to being able to see all different kinds of work, right. and that's a hugely significant and important thing. And I think the way that it's taught needs to change. I think the way that the canon um, has been put together needs to change. I think that actually like it's kind of one of those things where you're talking about the world of photography and we're like looking at like this one tiny section of the world of photography. I think that we're, we're seeing a lot of kind of shifts happening that are absolutely um, necessary, not only in terms of representation, but also in the way that we begin talking about and teaching photography at large. Yeah, yeah I would agree with, with all that, um, I feel excited about a lot of the photography that I'm seeing. You know, a lot of it reses 
speaking to about people using photography as like a tool of empowerment. Um, you know, and I feel like er my earlier comments about Instagram and the, the division between my work or like my art practice and like general image making uh, was maybe a little uh, dismissive, but I think, you know, there can be ways that like Instagram or other forms of social media that are image based can lead to that same feeling of empowerment. You know, it's like everyone has access to this platform and sometimes it's used in a negative way and sometimes it's used in a really powerful, uh, empowering way. Um, and then specifically in terms of like art photography, it's just really exciting to see younger people, you know, I'm 38, I'm not like a super old man, but there's a new generation of photographers who I think are doing a lot of what Rez is saying. They're taking these ideas and traditions of photography and kind of turning them on their heads or using them to, you know, to suit their purposes that have all, have historically existed outside of what we consider like art or respectable art or historical art. Um, and that is, is, is super exciting to me. And so finally, what advice would you offer to listeners when they look at a photograph? How should we be seeing photographic images differently? Uh, I don't know how, what to say about how to see them differently, but I think one thing is to just actually look, you know. Um, totally. Russ and I both taught at the Yale University Art Gallery when we were in grad school, and a lot of what that teaching practice and philosophy is about careful and close looking, you know, like actually spending time looking at something. And, you know, we'd start off conversations with our students from a very young age to like high school students to other adults and you'd say, all right, we're going to look at this, this artwork and now tell me what you see. So the, 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 the emphasis was on what are you seeing? Not necessarily what are you interpreting, right? That kind of comes through the conversation about what you're seeing. And I think there, you know, there's a lot of, about just looking carefully at, at photography and artwork in general. Um, which is a pleasurable experience, you know, even if you don't necessarily walk away, like figuring out the work or having some sort of epiphany, there is a pleasure and a joy in just sort of taking the time to slow down and really, you know, observe all the details, uh, allow yourself to kind of get lost in the, in the looking of it. You know, I think, again, as we talk about being saturated by so many images, it can be really easy to just like scroll through or walk by, um, but if you stop and like really take a minute, I think a lot of the things that we were talking about, you know, uh, how things are kind of hidden, but on the surface, like those things start to be revealed as you spend more time just allowing yourself to look. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you, Bryson. And I think that looking with all of your being as present as you can with an image and being as um, conscious of its functioning as possible is, is beneficial so that you're kind of able to separate separate it from truth right. um, and objectivity because it, it doesn't exist. So I think that that's probably one of the most important aspects and then from there you get all of these a whole treasure trove of experiences to come from what you'll find right you know? exactly well on that note i think we could end the conversation here thank you both so much for coming on perspectives yeah thanks for having us thank you for listening to this episode of perspectives a podcast from zeit contemporary art until next time, I'm your host, Samuel Shapiro.